Okay, well, there he is, everybody's favorite neighbor. How you doing, man? <laughs> yeah, I'm everybody's favorite neighbor. Indeed. I'm fine, man. How are you, Gano? I'm okay. You know, well, where I want to start with you, Luke, is that we met owing to the, our late great friend, Jeff Healy. That's right. And, and I'll, I'll always thank it. And I think you mentioned that to me once, too, that it, you know, it was nice that we became friends because yeah, of Jeff. Yeah, for sure. But uh, I want to know where you met Jeff, and what the hell you thought when you saw that you know unique style of guitar playing? What it was that all about? Well, I was aware of Jeff way before I met him, and when I met him, it was at the Pori, it was at the Pori Jazz Festival in Finland, in like two thousand, I think it was. I was out with Edgar Winter. We had a little project together for a minute, and we were doing all the festivals and stuff like that. And I met him, and we just hit it off immediately. Man, it was great. It was like long lost friends and we had a lot of fun we were both kind of crazy back then we had a gas you know we had a lot of fun <laughs> he was one of those guys man yeah he was very special he was high a big heart too you know that i remember having him in we i took him to to uh, see jose feliciano at a small club he was in town and i thought it would be interesting to put ironic that you would say you took him to see how well, that's how we talk around Jeff, right? I know, I'm just messing with you. I remember being at his club that night when he was at the bar, and I said, hey, Healy, you should see this place. And he, of course, he told me to F off, right? Yeah, but right. After, after introducing him to, to Jose and we watched him play, Jeff says, let's go back to my club and we'll jam. Okay, so he's in the back seat. We're loaded. And my gal's driving. And I said, uh, hey, Healy, you want to see how blind I am? And he goes, yeah, I'd like to see that. So I took off my glasses and I passed them back to him. And he stuck him on. He goes, yep, you're blind. All right. <laughs> <laughs> he was such a great cat, man. Miss him every day, you know? Me too, man. Me too. So uh, you, you were born and bred in Los Angeles, and you still live in Studio City in Hollywood. I live right? in the hills above it, you know? Nice. Your dad, uh, by the way, uh, this is the only book I've ever read twice, okay? <laughs> and I, I got... I'm still in the middle of yours, man. I haven't, I haven't got to the alien stuff yet. Well, we'll get to, we'll talk about that later. It's coming up. Well, you know, it's a, I'm fascinated by all of it. Thanks. I, yeah, I, well, I, want, we'll, I want to hear your, I want to hear. Reese gets visited too. So we're all in the same bag yeah. here. Wow, man. So your dad was in the television business as an assistant. Television director. Movies. Yeah, my grandfather too. Yeah. And, and, and he was working on I Dream of Genie. He was working on Bewitched, Happy Days. Uh, he did the Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. What See, was that was like cool. for you as a kid? Um, I didn't, the only time I went down to see my dad at work was when he was doing I Dream of Genie, because I wanted to meet Genie, I guess. <laughs> and I was just a little teeny kid, and, and you know, I used to see her in black and white, she, there she was in color and everything, and she was so nice. It was really great. Did, uh, was your dad working on Ozzy and Harriet when Ricky Nelson was doing the yeah. thing with James Burton? Yeah. Did I you ever go? James did, about that once, man. Yeah, said, you won't believe this, man. But I was born when you were playing in Ricky's band. On my dad was doing Ozzy and Harry. He was like, really? I go, yeah. He was the AD, assistant well, director. You, you know the funny thing is, I used to watch it. Ricky Nelson before Elvis, before the Beatles, that was the guy I wanted to be more than anything. And well, I would watch that. You got to be that. Yeah. So, so I remember I convinced my dad that I needed to take guitar lessons because I wanted to be like Ricky Nelson. So he, he signed me up for 10 weeks. And uh, of course, all I did was I went home, banged on the guitar, mimed to Hello, Mary Lou, and made my lip curl. You know, after 10 weeks, the teacher says, Mr. Godovitz, this kid will never be a musician. Now, you've got a similar story. Like I, that. Do. I do. Please. Well, no, I mean, you know, when when I was in grammar school, you know, I was already playing guitar since I was seven and a half years old or whatever it was. Um, and they obviously didn't have a place for the guitar in the orchestra. At that time, rock and roll was new and it was frowned upon, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so they put me on a violin, which has nothing to do with the guitar at all. Uh, <laughs> And I just couldn't, you know, with the trying to read music and trying to make sound on this thing. I sound like two cats fucking on crystal meth or something. You know? And um, it was pitiful. And the teacher told my parents that your son has no musical talent. You should probably discourage him from 
playing a musical instrument. He doesn't have it. And my parents are like, oh, well, he plays a guitar. And they go, well, you know, electric guitar is not a real instrument. <laughs> well, here I sit, you know, 45 years later being in a business, you know, for real, like making records and touring and shit. So. I always wonder what happened to the guy. You know, I mean, I'm certainly not at your level, but, you know, I've had a pretty good career, too. And I always wonder what happened to the guy that predicted that, because I, I seem to recall, like, I was playing the uh, the, the symbol thing that, yeah. well, he was telling my dad that this kid was never going to be a musician. Right. Do, do you think that, do you think that the, this guy that told your folks that live long enough to see some of your success? I, I, I don't know. Yeah, you don't care either, right? Not really. I mean, you know. I'm you know school was just a, a means and then to meet my friends to do what i'm doing now you know what i mean and that's what all i was concerned i mean i paid my sister to do my homework and term papers because i was studying music right i needed to practice i was in orchestration i was doing guitar lessons uh, harmony theory piano uh, the whole thing you know psych well, i read in the book that you made a conscious decision early in life that the only way that you were going to be a success in what you wanted to do was to do exactly what you just said to study. Well, I murder. played by ear until I was about 14. And then my, my, and then my father said, well, if you're really going to do this and you have to learn it all, you have to learn how to read, you have to learn how to do all this stuff. And I said, well, okay. And then I met Steve Picaro in 10th grade or whatever it was. And then I met the family. And I realized studio musician. Wow. Is that a viable, that's a viable possibility i mean it's hard to get into but i was here and i knew people and if i had the chance i could make it happen maybe i could make it happen and but i needed the tools to be ready you know because you have to be able to read and you have to be able to work under pressure and all that other stuff you know what i mean and some people just don't have the stomach for it you're walking in not knowing what you're going to do at all be ready to do anything were you living in la were you familiar yeah. with the the wrecking crew did you know who of they course. were yeah, of course, man. We used to, you know, and everybody that followed them, you know what I mean? I mean, you know, we used to go see Carlton Rittenauer, Robin Ford play and all the guys were in that, all their bands were all like number one top studio guys, you know? So we wanted to do that. So when we were kids, we'd go watch them and, you know, say hello and actually be, you know, breathe the same air and everything, you know? And it became, you know, and then I, I just met everybody through Jeff Vaccaro and David Page and, the rest sort of happened, you know. The the Picaro situation. I mean, you got three brothers that are incredible talents. The father as as well. They were neighbors of yours, right? No, but we went to the same school. You know, okay. School, you know, I'm close enough. I mean, a short car ride. So it was Steve first. The keyboard player was the one that got you in the door, right? Yeah. Well, Jeff was in Steely Dan when we were in high school. So when I met all those guys. Uh, you know, I realized while wow, the entry level, you have to be that good to be considered good enough to have a career at this. So, S I, you know, I, I mean, we had a little insight because, you know, Steve's father and David's father, Marty Page, legendary producer and arranger, you know, he did all those Ray Charles records. He did the high laws. He, he did everybody. I mean, Sinatra, Sammy. He did all their charts and stuff like that. He was one of the, the best ever. And so those guys all have these heavy musical backgrounds with heavy fathers and stuff like that. And, you know, there was no musicians in my family. I'm the alien sperm cell. Now, <laughs> now, my, now I pass it on to my older son. He's got the bug. He's a professional musician. He's really I've cool. been watching his stuff. He's very gifted, man. He is, man. He's, he's a great kid, too. I'm really proud of him, man. Yeah, looks he's like a good guy. Good man. You know, much like myself and millions of other guys, I mean, it was the Beatles that really, you know, sparked sure. the, the fuse. Sure but I loved your line in the book where you said, and I, I want to read this, you compare it, seeing the Beatles for the first time, you compared it to the scene in The Wizard of Oz, where it went from black and white into color. Oz, and, yeah. and everything's in color. Well, I mean, I was just a little kid. That was the first thing that made me go, what was that? I want more of that. I want that sound. You know, Mr. George Harrison soloing, you know, that sound, that twangy, reverby guitar and stuff on ice. I saw her standing there, that great solo that just so full of energy and interesting phrasing and stuff like that. And I just loved the sound of the harmonies and the beat and the grooves, Ringo. And, you know, I never thought in a million years I'd even meet these guys, let alone work with them. And, you know, I've had a chance to work with Paul 
and George was my friend. We played together. And Ringo, I've been in his band for nine years and it's going, you know. He's been, yeah, I mean, you know, do you wake up and sometimes pinch yourself and go like, yeah. how did this happen? I mean. Well, you know, it never gets old when Ringo FaceTime me, you know what I mean? It's like. Now you're writing songs. With if you. I'm out, you know, if I'm out, I go, hey, I gotta take this call. It's Ringo. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> I said, hey, boss, say hello, you know. That's what you and Jeff, uh, uh, hang on. Yeah, it was Jeff. You and Jeff, uh, or was it Jeff that appeared in Give My Regards to Broad Street? Oh, me and Jeff. Right. Both of us. Yeah, we're in the silly love song sequence. Which well, I actually did. watched again the other day. It's, it was ridiculous. The makeup thing and the hair and all that. We didn't know we had to wear that stuff until we got there. We had worked with Paul on the Thriller record. We did the the girl is mine and all that stuff like that. And Paul and Linda took a shine to me and Jeff and invited us over to be in the movie, which was thrilling. You know, while I was there, I got to meet Dave Gilmore because he was wanted Jeff to play on his record. And we ended up spending an entire evening together, hanging out. We've been buddies ever since, and he's one of my heroes <clears throat> and wonderful cat. You know, and it's just an incredible experience to be on hanging with Paul and Linda and George Martin and Jeff Emmerich and like you know being able to have lunch with them every day and just <laughs> ask every stupid beetle question that there was, you know, they let, at first I was like, oh, you shouldn't do that. And, you know, it was like, and I asked Linda, you know, after we got to be a little friendly as we were sharing the same part of the stage, she's a wonderful woman. I really loved her to death. And I mentioned, oh, I don't want to do that. It's Paul. And she goes, oh, Paul loves talking about the Beatles. And I said, really? He does? He goes, yes. So I launched into a, I started playing, we were plugged in live you know and uh i started playing please please me and everybody jumped in paul started singing and stuff like it was it was amazing except lewis johnson was playing bass and he didn't know any beatles songs that's weird well he just he, yeah we thought it was weird too but i mean who doesn't know please please me for god's sake it's like in our dna for uh, sure but you know hey you know it, it was funny and we laughed and we played it anyway and then that opened up the whole floodgate of me being able to ask all those questions. How did you get the sound on fixing a hole? And how did you do this? And when you recorded this, was I was told this is what happened. Do you remember what Mike sees? You know, how did you record? I heard you double bust. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, I was able to ask all the geek questions, you know? And well, they were like into talking about it. It was fun, you know? That, it's great. I don't know, you know, you know how nervy I can be. And, you know, I, I'm sort of the same way, but like, it was sort of like on the set that you were not really supposed to ask Beatle questions, right. but then you played a little bit of Strawberry Fields, and then all of a I sudden, said, I, 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 I was goofing around with the Mellotron. I mean, how can you not? You know what I mean? You yeah. know? And all of a sudden, I was like, "Hey, you did that pretty good." You know, you play the right riff, and it opened the floodgates. Yes, it did. Yeah, was it the same? I mean, obviously, you're you're good friends with Ringo now. You write songs yeah. with him. You've been in the band nine years. Yeah. Uh, is it? Do you still talk about that stuff with him, or do you know well, enough? That you don't you know, if he wants to talk about it, and, and you know, we, it usually once a day, you know, something will come up, and oh, well, me and the lads, and he'll start to tell us some wonderful <laughs> story. You know? And you know, I it, I love it, but you know, it's not like it's all every time you get with him, it's like oh, tell me more Beatles stories. It's like it doesn't work that. If he wants to talk about, it, then then the door is open. You know. Okay. But well, he, you doesn't, know, like, he doesn't remember any of the technical stuff. Like, yeah, he goes, "I just played me drums," you know. I was at I was at one of his uh, rehearsals, not before you were in the band. I think uh, can't remember who was playing guitar, but anyway, uh, I've completely lost my my train of thought. It, it happens, uh, and it's old age. Bro. Yeah, that's what. It, no, no, I'm looking. I'm reading while I should be talking. But you were the one that invited me to come up to Rama when you were rehearsing there. Right. And I remember we hung out. I was the only civilian in the in the hall watching you guys go through the right. motions. And then the last night you said to me, hey, you know, Gato, you haven't asked. Do you want to meet the boss? And I went, what, Springsteen's here? And you <laughs> laughed at it and you said, no, that's what we call Ringo. And I said, oh, okay, I've already met Springsteen. So, yeah, that would be great. And then the next night before you, the first show, uh, a guy came out, an assistant, and said, "Are you Luke's friends?" Yes. And I was with Joe Rockman from Jeff Ely's band. Yes, and I and the guy says, "There's no photographs, no autographs." And I said, "It's cool, man. I just want to shake the cat's hand." And he goes, "He doesn't shake hands. He just bumps forearms." And right at that moment, Ringo opened the door to the green room, and he came and he goes, 
I don't shake hands. I just bump forearms. And I, I said, that's exactly what he said you would say. Yeah. And he started laughing. But uh, like, I mean, I always, you know, I've met Paul before, but I will always thank you, man, for like, you know, oh, that second he's little riff of meet and Ringo star, you know? Uh, you know, he's a very special human being, man. That's all I can say. I love him so much. No, you, you did. Je it was one of the tributes that you were doing that where George Harrison came around because you ran into him. Well, somebody invited yeah. you for dinner. Well, no, I met him in a nightclub called The Gate, which is no longer there. It was in 1992, the end of 92, after Jeff Picaro had passed. Right. Three months on the road all over the world. And we were playing L.A. as a tribute to Jeff. We had all these incredible people coming out. Donald Fagan came out and Steely Dan had not been put together again until after that. And Denny Diaz, who was the original guitar player, he came out and played with us. And we did some couple Steely tunes. Uh, Don Henley, Boss Gags, Mike McDonald, David Crosby, James Newton Howard. Um, oh, gosh, Eddie Van Halen. Um, it was really something else, man. And then I had met George at this club. I just wanted to say, like you, I just wanted to say, just I just want to say hi, man. I worked with Paul and, you know, I'm, you know, I don't <laughs> bother him, you know. And so they went up and said, hey, there's this guy, look at them. He said, well, tell him to come over. So I sat down, I just said my little, you know, my gosh, you know, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have a life, you know. And he was sweet and I was kind of funny. So he cracked up, he goes, hey, sit down, man, hang out. And so I ended up spending up a few hours with him, just hanging out. You know, I asked him a bunch of geeky questions and I knew what song <laughs> he played on and I knew what his parts were. And, and I said, at the end of it, we kind of hit it off a little bit. And I said, well, let me give you my number. And like, you know, we're playing this gig for our tribute as our drummer passed away. And there's all these people playing. And the last song we played is the Wealth of My Friends. You want to come and, you know, hang out? I know you probably don't want to play, but, you know, if, if you're, I'll leave a couple of tickets in case. He's like, yeah, yeah. I figured I'll never hear from him again. And he, I'm sitting there working on this, you know, the final piece with everybody because I got everybody to sing. I'll get you sing this, you sing that, blah, blah, blah. We're rehearsing backstage around a piano. I'm sitting at the piano giving everybody parts and stuff. And all of a sudden, somebody goes there's somebody here to see i go not now man i said like i'm in the middle of this you know and he, and he and he goes no this person's from liverpool and i went no shit and i turn around and george is standing in the doorway and he goes didn't think you didn't think i'd show up did you and i said no man i didn't i said but you want to you're here come out and play with us on this you know it's just you know i said but we're doing the joe conquer version you know and he, he cracked up and he goes yeah okay and, uh, you know, he, I get him my old Les Paul, you know, I said, you're, you're going to play this. So I gave him my old 59 first to play. <clears throat> and, uh, we're sitting there at the piano. He's playing along. I said, we get to the bridge and there's the break. Bum, bum, dun, dun. Do you need anybody? Dun, 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 dun. And during the stop, he goes, you hear this voice go, that's not how me and the lads played it. <laughs> He so, broke the room up, man. He was so wonderful. And then we got to be friends and hang out. And he would call me when he'd come into town, go meet me for dinner. You know, it's like, and you know, I got to hear Freeze a Bird before it came out. Just it yeah, was, that's so unreal, great. man. He so, so had good. he ever? Did he ever? Did had he ever heard the Cocker version of uh, of with yeah, a little? He must have heard it. Yeah. yeah. But did you, did you have to actually show him the arrangement of it? No, he figured it out real quick. You know what I mean? So he's one of those guys too, eh? Well, listen to those parts, man. They weren't all written out. Those guys came up with their own parts. Man. Yeah. Very nice. So how did you get the call to get into Ringo's band? How did that happen? Greg, Greg Bissonette recommended right. me to uh, Dave Hart, who's Ringo's agent and sort of producer and a guy that finds other members to play. And uh, we have, they were on the road and we happened to be playing Paris that night, sold out show, which was great. And he brought Dave Hart to see me because he said, he wanted me to be in the band. I said, I want to be, I want to do this more than anything. Please get me in this band. And, you know, Ringo has to say yes. You know what I mean? He has to like, like the music and he has to like approve it all. But they went and gave me a rave review and said, and everybody else who was in the band at the time said, oh no, he's, he's great. And then Jim Keltner put a word, good word in for me and I got to call him. And I've been there ever since. I told him he has to kill me to get rid of me. <laughs> Uh, are you the longest serving member of the band now? One of them. I think Bissonette might be the longest on drums. Second, right. second drums. So I've seen him a couple of times with Ring do the thing. 
I've got some viewer questions here. I'm going to read this. Uh -oh. This is from a really good guitar player. His name is Frank Cosentino. He's a Jimi Hendrix freak. Oh, great. And he does them really well, too. He'd, he'd love your version of uh, Red House. Oh, really? I'll tell him thanks. Yeah. yeah, you just did. So that's great. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, he says, if if playing with three of the Fab Four, uh, he says, ask Luke if playing with three of the Fab Four messed his head, messed up his head. Like, okay, I'm making music with a Beatle in the same room. Did you well, ever stop to think about that? that you had yeah, I, of course I did. On, on Ringo's last album, I co-wrote two songs with him and Paul played bass. So it was me, Paul, and Ringo. So that was pretty cool. Um, and I got to do the Beatles 50th anniversary show. Yeah. Right? backup you know it was an all-star band backup band you know with everybody was incredible and we got to play behind everybody for paul and ringo and that was a really fun week we did the grammys and uh, it was it was just really incredible to be around all that you know it was very exciting for me considering i started playing because of the beatles and yeah. 50 years later i'm standing on stage going i got invited to this party you know what i mean this is i'm looking at paul and ringo i don't oh, want this yeah it was a little it got a little verklempt you know what I mean? Of course. You know, well, you know, like, wow, I actually pull, you know, it hit me when I saw the hard days night clips before in the black and white. I said, Man, my 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 dad's mom, my grandma, man, took me to see that like 20 times. You know, I couldn't get enough of it, you know. Don't have, have, have you seen any advanced copies of the Get Back movie yet? Yeah, I actually what? I, I didn't see the whole thing, but uh I don't know, about a year and plus ago, Ringo took me to a screening. He goes, come with me, and I want you to see some of this Peter Jackson footage. He goes, it's a whole different ending to the band. Wow. And I'm sitting there with him and the family in a private room, sitting you know, sitting right in front of him, and I'm like, watching all this. You know, there's several takes of the stuff on the roof. It wasn't just one take on each side. Right. We're up there for a bit. And there's all this incredible footage of them in the studio, laughing and having, it's, it's going to be a happy ending, as opposed to the darker ending that we know well from the original Let It Be movie. And the guys never liked that movie. I mean, well, that's why it's never come out on DVD. I can't speak for them, but I think that may have, they may have been disappointed that it ended so dark and sad. You know what I mean? There was like, when it should, their music is they're still number one. You know, they still do billions of streams and sell millions of records every year. Still the gold standard for music and something we all reference to when we're making records. Give me something a little more Beely right here. And yeah, everybody exactly. knows what that is. Yeah, that's right. Give me a Ringo Phil, give me this, you know, get, you know, uh, I need a more George guitar thing. And you know what it is, you know, it, it's, it's for me anyway, for my Wait, group of friends. You know, he, here, I listened to uh, your new album a couple of times. We oh, bought okay. it. Uh, it's a great record. I, I got some notes I want to tell you about later, okay. but the run to me track that's got Ringo playing drums on it. I mean, you, you can just shut your eyes and you know who's playing the drums. As soon as he goes for the Tom Tom fills, you you just know that style, you know. Well, he's he, you know he has a very unique style. He's left-handed. He leads with his left hand, so that's why some of those drum fills are. How, why would he think of that? Well, it's a matter of necessity. Like he's not. Let me dazzle you with my chops, player. But understand, all those Beatle records felt so good. There was no click tracks and shit. That was just oh. the way he played. Yeah. Anybody that said gives Ringo shit about his playing, I'll punch in the face. Yeah, I, I agree with you, man. I mean, uh, what? I mean, how many guys do you know that can, if you just play the drum part, you know what song it is? Yeah, tomorrow never knows. Composed rain, all of his drums. My parts. life. He could, that was all his ideas. You know, he yeah. executed them. You know, what I mean, yeah. he, he had incredible feel. Him and Paul, what a rhythm section. You know. I want to run a few names by you. OK, because you've recorded with everybody. I mean, what, what, what absolutely slays me in the back of this book is there's about 30 pages of your discography. So what is it, like 5,000 albums or I something? Know, it's, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. I don't know. Yeah, let's, don't... let's start with uh, Quincy Jones. He's great, man. I, I, first time I got to work with him was uh, on his The Dude record. <laughs> and I was in my early, like 22 years old or something like that. David Foster recommended me to him and he took a shine to me. We hit it off musically and he's a great, I'm going to see him in a couple of weeks in Montreux. I'm going to go out there and hang. I got an, an invite to, uh, an incredible invite to go there and just hang out. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to play. I'm just going to hang out with some other really great players and, and, and with my girlfriend and just go get out of his house and travel a little bit. But Q has always been great. But after I finished the dude and it was really successful, he, he told me, uh, 
listen, I want you on the next Michael Jackson record because he's coming off off the wall and going, well, I said, wow, yeah, it'd be an honor. I'd love to. So I did about six, seven albums in a row with him during that period of time. A couple of, there was a couple, three years I was doing everything he did. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to, you know, we, we've stayed friends and stuff, you know, I mean, he's a giant. Everybody loves Q, you know. So were you working with David Foster? That's the next one on it, as you mentioned him. Uh, when he first came to L.A.? 18. I've known David since I was 18 years old. That's when right. I met him the first time. And he was an incredibly uh, gifted guy who was really helpful in the early parts of my career. I mean, he used me on everything, man. I learned so much from him. You know? And he learned from David Page. So David helped him get started, you know. And uh, so there was a lot of love. We were all hanging out together. He introduced me to a lot of people. I don't, you know, for that, I'll always remember him uh, so fond. As a matter of fact, I think he's going on this trip, so I haven't seen him in forever. That's great, man. I, I got a question from this guy here. He says, I'd love to hear stories about working with the Tubes and David Foster, some of the best guitar playing and sounds ever on their two capital albums. Oh, wow. Well, from a guy named Don Baird. Uh, thank you for that. But no, I, that was because David Foster invited me in. I guess they were trying to make the tubes a little bit more radio friendly band i mean i was a big fan of the tubes when i was in high school and i had never met any of them before but uh foster goes just show up and we'll write something on the spot i said cool so we showed up and um fee was there and prairie was there um and foster was there and the bass player was there but he didn't want to play on my song because he it was an outside writer so I ended up playing bass on the track after we cut the track, but I had the opening riff of Talk to You Later, and then we just kind of went from there and uh, wrote it on the spot. Within an hour, we were cutting the track. We had nothing within the hour. I, I had put a bunch of guitars. I played the bass part, and Fee was working on the lyrics in the room. We were all just throwing ideas around. And uh, that was the first one, and since that was really successful, they asked me to come back, and I did She's a Beauty uh, with David and Fee, and I wrote that, and uh, it's pretty much the same thing but it was their two most successful records that's the irony you know i saw them once at maple leaf gardens it was an incredible show they are a fantastic live band it has nothing to do with the musicianship of the band they're all great players they just i guess they weren't writing that kind of stuff and david wanted me in on it because he was producing the record but i felt kind of weird i'm going whenever you're doing stuff like that and it's a band and you're doing i've had to like record guys parts that couldn't cut it you know what i mean like re-record after they got the track and stuff i had to go in and just play the dumb eighth note parts and stuff because the guy's time was funny got red light fever couldn't hang with it could do the solos but couldn't do the the dumb shit you know well so yeah. how the guitar player was spooner right no so i'm not talking about the tubes i did so I, I in general i can't tell you who it was because i signed a non-disclosure oh. But, you know, it was an established band, you know what I mean? And, and the okay. poor guy sitting in the room watching me do this. It's kind of like you know, watching your... me fuck his wife or something like that. You know? I watched you today doing the uh, the vaccinated uh, oh, uh, yeah. riff on the Ramones one. And, yeah, Kyle's and a buddy, like, and today's just one, one note solo, and you're playing it, and then you're looking at your watch. I, I almost... Crap myself laughing, man. Funny. Ed Stasium, who produced the remotes and played, he was the guy that played the one note solo. He <laughs> hit me up and he was going, I love it. That's hilarious. You know, and I was going, Oh, you're, some of the Ramones fans are not happy about this. But, you know. <laughs> it's very I, funny. I the can't lyrics are anybody. Well, Kyle Gass is a buddy of mine. Yeah. We met on a Harry, Harry Shearer Shear thing. Uh, him and Jack Black were there, and Jack was great. He was a really lovely guy. But I got to be more friendly with Kyle, and we started hanging out a little bit. And he just called me because I want you to do this. He goes, he goes, the irony would be great, you know, like me playing the one note solo, you know. Well, that reminds me of uh, you also did that in insanely weird solo in the Cheech and Chong movie. Oh well, that that was funny <laughs> because I had just gotten a Floyd Rose tremble. I got the third one. Eddie Van Halen had got the second one. And I got the third one and it was brand new. And it's like, you know, you could beat the shit out of this thing and it would come back in tune if it was locked up. Right. So I was, I was hired to do um, a main title theme with Foster for the tubes. I'm um, not the tubes, the Cheech and Chong's next movie was the second movie after up in smoke. So this is late seventies. 
and I had just got this thing and I was showing it. I was using it on the, on the session. I said, check this out guys. And you know, I, I started playing the guitar then I threw it across the room. I was going, ah, I picked it up a bling perfectly in tune. And Tommy plays guitar. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and he goes, man, he goes, that's hysterical. He goes, can we record some of that shit? And we started smoking some weed. How can you not smoke weed with Cheech and John? You know what I mean? <laughs> and Foster was kind of like a little bit miffed, like, hey, wait a second, this isn't what we're here for. You know, and I just said, well, I'll throw it down. I'll throw it down a couple things. He goes, but don't play good. He goes, don't play too good. Just make some noise and stuff like that. Throw it, you know, feedback and stuff. So I, that's why, I, so I made all this racket just for a laugh and I never thought anything about it. I did. And then we did the main title, which they ended up not using. And uh, when I, I went to see the movie, when it came out, I knew nothing about it. This is way before social media or anybody was doing emails and shit. I just did the session, but I was a fan of teaching. John. I said, well, let me go see the movie. So I go, I didn't even know the main title didn't make the cut. You know what I mean? And I said, well, I'll go, you know, let's go watch it. So I'm watching the movie and I'm going, you know, we're just laughing through the movie. And all of a sudden he's in the music store and I hear it. And I go, I was with my first wife. And I turn around, and go, holy shit, that's me. It's terrible. <laughs> 